Hello, I'm Carl Herzog, public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. By the time the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor began on the morning of December 7, 1941, the Pearl Harbor Naval Base outside of Honolulu had become one of the largest naval facilities uh, for the U.S. in the Pacific Theater. They began expanding that base dramatically as early as 1939 in anticipation of war, but initial construction and development of the facility there began in 1899, almost immediately after the U.S. annexed Hawaii as a territory. However, the earliest connections of Pearl Harbor to the development of a U.S. base there actually began a lot earlier. More, nearly a hundred years before the Japanese attack began uh, in 1941, USS Constitution visited Honolulu in what was then the independent nation of Hawaii uh, in November of 1845. This sketch shows a U.S. naval warship in Honolulu Harbor in Hawaii around that time, although we don't believe that this sketch was intended to show USS Constitution. The sketch is part of the USS Constitution Museum's collection. What it does demonstrate, however, is how relatively undeveloped Honolulu was uh, at the time. The independent nation of Hawaii had long been uh, under a variety of designs by other European nations who were eager to take control of the fertile ground there. The Hawaiian at the time were not as concerned uh, about incursions from the U.S., and were willing to welcome Constitution when she arrived in 1845, but they were still concerned about incursions from other European nations. For Constitution's sake, Hawaii was one of the latter port stops on what had been a more than two year long circumnavigation of the globe. Constitution and her crew had a variety of missions in the port stops they made during this long world cruise, and Hawaii was not a whole lot different. This was in part uh, a diplomatic as well as an uh, economic boosting mission. And in Hawaii, they were concerned about uh, ports for American whalers working in the Pacific, among other things. However, while they were there, a U.S. missionary acting on behalf of the Hawaiian government approached Constitution and asked that uh, Lieutenant Joseph Curtis, a Marine Corps lieutenant on board the ship, would assist in helping the Hawaiians find a specific place that would be good for establishing fortifications there. Curtis surveyed all of Honolulu Harbor uh, as part of this, as well as the surrounding area, and he did examine an existing fort that had been built at the entrance to Honolulu Harbor earlier. However, when he finally sent a report back to Judd from Mazatlan, Mexico, Constitution's next stop on, the, on their voyage, the report indicated that he thought, the Curtis thought, the best uh, location for the Hawaiians to establish and fortify um, a place would be the Pearl River entrance to Pearl Harbor. This was the first indication that a recommendation that Pearl Harbor could serve as not only a fortified entry point, um, but also a base. At the time, the river entrance was still relatively narrow uh, and shallow, but Curtis thought it was the most secure place in part because of that. He emphasized to the Hawaiians that if they were going to fortify this river entrance, that they do so with fortifications that would have a lasting impact. He was specifically re recommending Martello Towers be constructed there. However, the really significant development of fortifications there did not really begin until 50 years later, uh, once the U.S. had annexed Hawaii as a U.S. territory. At that point, construction and development proceeded at a fairly rapid pace, and throughout the first half of the 1900s, all the way up until the fateful attack in 1941, the base had been slowly growing and developing in Pearl Harbor. But Constitution's connections to Pearl Harbor don't end with that early surveying. By the time the attack happened in 1941, a number of the ships that were located in Pearl Harbor bore the names of former commanders and other crew members of USS Constitution. This aerial photo from October 30th of 1941, just a month before the attack, uh, shows the variety of ships that were anchored and stationed at Pearl Harbor, 
among which included the USS Hull, USS Preble, USS McDonough, and of the lesser known ones also the USS Ward. The USS Ward, seen here shortly after being launched, was a Wix-class destroyer built in 1918. On the morning of the Japanese attack, uh, the USS Ward, under the command of Lieutenant Commander William Outerbridge, was on patrol at the entrance to Pearl Harbor when they received uh, a report of a periscope in the vicinity and began searching for it. After uh, nearly two hours, they spotted the periscope, once again following another ship that was entering Pearl Harbor, and the USS Ward attacked. The midget submarine, the midget Japanese submarine that was following uh, a ship into Pearl Harbor was sunk at the time, and as a result, USS Ward was considered responsible for the first American-caused casualties of World War II. The USS Ward was named for James Harmon Ward, seen here. Ward, born in 1806, attended a military academy in Norwich, Vermont, graduating in 1823, and immediately was appointed a midshipman in the U.S. Navy after that. Uh, shortly after becoming a midshipman, his first tour of duty, uh, beginning in 1824, was on board USS Constitution for four years in the Mediterranean. Ward became part of what was a new cadre of academically trained military officers, and he continued to follow sort of the study of warfare um, and passing that on to new officers through education throughout the rest of his career. He actually took time off from uh, the Navy to follow scientific pursuits, but then returned later to teach ordnance at the U.S. Naval Academy and was one of its first executive officers uh, when it was established in Annapolis in the 1840s. The commemoration of Ward for a ship named after him came as a result of his also holding the distinction of being the first uh, naval officer to die during the American Civil War. Ward was killed on June 27, 1861, while standing on the deck of the ship he was commanding, the USS Thomas Freeborn, that was providing gunfire support to Union forces ashore in the southern area of the Chesapeake Bay. Ward's namesake ship, the USS Ward, continued to serve in the inshore squadron patrolling for submarines uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor until it was sent in 1942 back to Washington for conversion to uh, troop transport. After that, the ship uh, was sent out to the Pacific and spent a year and a half transporting sailors, soldiers, and Marines among the various islands until December 7, 1944, when she was in Leyte Gulf and attacked by uh, Japanese planes. Gunfire, anti-aircraft gunfire from the USS Ward caused a Japanese plane to spiral down in, crashing onto the deck. The crew evacuated the ship, um, and it was shortly scuttled thereafter, having been deemed too badly damaged to be recovered. The stories of James Harmon Ward, his namesake ship, the USS Ward, and their connections back to Constitution along with the connections of Constitution all the way back in 1844 to the development of Pearl Harbor as a base in the first place, all point to the interconnectedness of, of history that we find so fascinating at the USS Constitution Museum. The linkages, the connections, the contingencies that draw threads across time are the kind of things that we continue to love to study here and are among the things that make not only naval and maritime history so fascinating, but all history uh, across time and throughout the world. I hope this has been enjoyable and educational for you as well, too. If you have questions, don't hesitate to post to any of our social media accounts. And if you have ideas for other topics you'd like to see videos on in the future, don't hesitate to post them, too. Thank you very much.